I'd like you to open your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. And in this lesson, I'm only going to look at two verses because we want to understand and review a little bit about who these two people are. So for now, let me just read with you 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Here's what it says. Paul has a very typical greeting. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if you recall our study of 1 Timothy, it sounds very similar. In fact, last night when I was reviewing these, I went back and I, I could flip back and forth in my Bible pages, and they're almost identical. In 1 Timothy, he had said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Here he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. It's very similar. There are some small differences, and the same thing when he talks about Timothy. First Timothy said, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. In this one, he says, to Timothy, my beloved child. I think that that's just a great term of affection. He's at the end of his life. He's thinking of all the times that Timothy and he had been together and all the conversations that they had had and all the time that they had spent together. And I think it just, it, it, it warmed his heart to think about Timothy and the relationship that they had had. So let's talk about Timothy for a little bit. I said when we studied 1 Timothy that when Paul uses the phrase, my beloved child or my child, He's not calling Timothy childish, and he's not saying that he's literally a child. It's a term of affection. It's a term of endearment. It's someone who is older looking at someone who is younger and saying, you know, I have such fondness for you. We talked about the fact that Tim, uh, Timothy to Paul had a very special relationship. We said, we're not sure if Paul introduced Timothy to Jesus Christ. I personally don't think so. But it could be, but it also means the sense that Paul treated Timothy as his spiritual child, that he took responsibility to raise him and to teach him and to mentor him and to disciple him. That certainly was true. But whether Paul introduced him to Christ, we're not exactly sure. And honestly, it doesn't matter. Timothy had a unique and profound faith in Jesus Christ, and Paul was responsible for the growth and maturity and the depth that Timothy had. How old is Timothy? We, we think that he's probably in his 30s. We think that maybe when 1 Timothy was written, he was in his early 30s. He would still be considered a very young man. Maybe now he's in his mid to late 30s. And maybe if you're a young person, you're saying, well, that sounds kind of old. Actually, not very old at all. Because at the age of 30 in the Jewish culture, that's when you were considered to be a full man. That's when you had arrived at the depth of your manness or your manhood. So Timothy is still within a number of years of that having become a man. What we know about Timothy and Paul is that they came together and that they served together in a city called Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey. It's a city in which Paul had worked and served and planted churches for about two and a half to three years. And we know that the two of them served in that place together for a period of time. And we know then that when Paul writes to Timothy, both letters, this is where Timothy is serving. We'll talk about the city and the churches of Ephesus in a little while. But what we know about Timothy's personality is that he was rather shy. He was rather introverted. He had some bouts of sickness. We don't know the depth of his illnesses, but he wasn't a strong and robust type of person. But what we know about his giftedness is that he had a very special gift for teaching. And Paul valued that in their relationship. Paul was this evangelist. Paul was this cutting-edge person. He was always out there planting something new, uh, provoking discussion, having these debates. And Timothy was the guy that came behind and taught and mentored and discipled and must have been very skilled at it. Well, after calling him, Timothy, my beloved child, he simply offers him these, these encouragements, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are three great words. Some of the same words that we saw in 1 Timothy, grace, mercy, and peace, the exact three words that he had offered to Timothy then. What is grace? 
Grace is giving us a favor we do not deserve. That no matter what our relationship is, grace is giving us something we do not deserve. Mercy is the exact opposite side. If you flip a coin to the other side, it's the opposite side of the coin. Mercy is not giving us something we do deserve. Grace gives us something we don't deserve, a favor, a good favor, something good. Mercy is withholding from us what we do deserve. I used examples of our family the first time I explained that. Let me just briefly review that again. If our children are not behaving appropriately, but I do something kind for them, even though they have not been good, that's grace. However, when our children have been bad, as I just described, and they deserve punishment, or they deserve to have certain privileges removed from them, and I don't withhold my love or those privileges from them, that's mercy. They're very closely related. And Paul says, Timothy, I wish for you the grace and mercy of God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. But how about that word peace? I think that that word peace in their context is enormously important. Peace, when we think of it, is just this calmness. And it's true, but I've come to understand peace not in the absence of conflict, but peace is found in the middle of a storm. Here in Russia right now, it's very hot. It's very dry. We're hoping that thunderstorms will come, that rain will fall, that the crops and the dachas could be watered and that the vegetables and the crops could grow. All of us here have experienced thunderstorms. I like a good thunderstorm. I like the thunder and the deep rumbling in the clouds. And I like it at, when I'm home in North Dakota, when I'm laying in bed and it's, it's late at night or after midnight or early in the morning, and you wake up to the sound of this, this, this rumbling sound. And when you're a child, you're a little bit afraid of it. But as an adult, I've come to like it because it tells me that rain is coming. And then you can hear the crack of the lightning and and it, and it kind of explodes. Everybody knows what lightning sounds like. And all of a sudden, when the thunderstorm is over, you don't, it's the absence of sound, and you go, I don't hear anything anymore. Sometimes we think that that's what peace is, that the storm has moved on, and finally all of my troubles are over, and now I have peace. The kind of peace that's described in the Bible is when the thunder is rumbling, the lightning is crashing, and in the midst of a tremendous rainstorm, we find peace in the middle of it. That in our house, we can sit in the living room, in the gathering room of our home, and we can sit on the couches, and we can talk to each other in perfect safety, in perfect peace, because we know that the house is strong. Our, our house is 100 years old. It was built early in the 1900s, but it has a strong foundation. It has strong walls. The windows are secure. So even when the thunder is rumbling and the lightning is crashing and the rain is pouring down, we feel safe. We have peace. I think that that word is profound for everyone who's a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus promised us, in this world, you will have trouble. He didn't promise that when you become a Christian, You'll avoid all the trouble in the world. In fact, he, he's almost as if he's saying, you're going to have trouble. It's not going to be easy. But then he said this, fear not, for I have overcome the world. Fear not, I have overcome the world. And in that, I think we find tremendous peace. Now, the one person I really did not talk very much about yet so far is the Apostle Paul, because I wanted to explain to you his circumstances a little bit. As I said, he's near the end of his life. We think that he's probably in his 60s. He's somewhere 65, 67 years old. He's coming to the end, and I think his story is just so amazing. He had been this superbly trained Jewish person. He rose to the top of his class. He became a Jewish leader. He became a Pharisee. He became a ruler of the Pharisees. When Christianity began to spread, it was his passion to root out these new Christians called the Way. And one day on the way to Damascus, far in the northern part, beyond the border of Israel, he was on his way to find some more Christians to arrest. And a bright light shines down. 
And all of his entourage with him falls down on the ground. And he's there. And this voice calls, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's, Who are you? The voice says, I'm Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now, we don't think that Paul ever saw Jesus while Jesus was on the earth. We don't think so. But he met Jesus that day, not in human flesh as one man to the other, but in this voice, in this bright light, and it blinded him. And that day, Paul's life was transformed. He had the new passion not to destroy Christians. Now he was one of them. He was going to pursue Christ as passionately as he had pursued the Jewish legalism of his faith. And he says here in verse 1, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And you say, well, I know that there were 12 disciples and they became the apostles. And well, Judas, he died and then they replaced him. Was Paul one of the 12? Uh, actually, he was not. He was called an apostle, but as he says, by the will of God or by the command of God, he was specially chosen that God called him and said, Paul, I'm appointing you. As an apostle, you could call him apostle number 13 if you wanted, but maybe he's just in a separate category. And he says, you are going to take my gospel message to the Gentile. My word, my gospel is not just for the Jews, it is for the Gentile. Paul, and so he began to preach and he began to teach after a time of seasoning and after a time of, of wilderness searching his own faith and what he knew. And so many things happened to him. This man knew suffering. Let me read a few verses for you from the letter called 2 Corinthians, verse, chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. Now, in our English translations, I chose to bring these words from a paraphrase called the message because it relates very well to our people in America because it's like 21st century English. And this is how he says, he describes his life. He says this, are they servants of Christ? I can go them one better. I can't believe I'm saying these things. It's crazy to talk this way. <clears throat> but I started and I'm going to finish. I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count, and at death's door, time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jews' 39 lashes. I've been beaten by Roman rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times, immersed in the open sea for a night and a day, in hard traveling year in and year out. I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city, at risk in the country, endangered by desert sun and sea storm, been betrayed by those I thought were my brothers. I've known drudgery and hard labor, many a long and lonely night without sleep, many a missed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. And that's not the half of it when you throw in the daily pressures and the anxieties of all the churches. When someone gets to the end of his rope, I feel the desperation in my bones. When someone is duped into sin, an angry fire burns in my gut. If I have to brag about myself, I'll brag about the humiliations that make me like Jesus. That's the description of his life. He doesn't say, oh, it was so hard to be a follower of Christ. Lord, why did you make it so hard? He's very honest. He describes how difficult it was. And he says, you know what? I consider it an honor to be made like Christ, to be a follower of Christ. So when they tell, if someone ever tells you, hey, if you become a Christian, your life will be easy. Your life will be great. You look at them and you say, that's not what God promised that almost certainly your life will be more difficult. But here's the thing. You have a grace, you have a mercy, you have a peace that passes all understanding. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. So where's Paul when he writes this letter? Let me tell you a little bit about that before we conclude this lesson. Paul is in a Roman prison. You say, well, I thought he was imprisoned once before. He was. 
and then he was released and he had some time to travel, but now he's been arrested. He was arrested in a distant city and brought back with barely the clothes on his back and he's thrown in the prison from which no one escapes and no one ever survives. Tradition tells us that this place is called the Mamertine Prison. We're not sure if it's exactly this place, but if it was, and for sake of this lesson, I'm going to assume that it was. Let me tell you a little bit about this prison. Maybe you've seen a prison. Maybe you've been in a prison. Maybe you've been a prisoner. This one, I think, is especially unique. This particular prison is underground in two different layers under the ground. This is a unique prison. This is a, pra a place where you took the political prisoners or the religious prisoners, and there was no escape. It was literally a pit. So from the floor level, you went down one level, and this is where a number of the prisoners were kept. But below that, one layer below that, they found what essentially was built as a water cistern. You know what a cistern is? It's a gathering place for water. Now, before there were wells and ability for water systems in cities, what a cistern was was to gather water for use. You could bucket it out or use it. So what the Romans did was they would take these special prisoners, put them down one level, and there was a hole in the top of this cistern. They would drop the prisoner down into the second layer below ground. Now, if you can imagine being 10 or 15 feet below ground, it's cold, it's damp, it's moist all of the time. It is a horrible condition. It's dark. Any light that would be there at all would have to be by candlelight or by a torch or something in there. And they said that the size of the cistern that they have found, it would hold about 30 to 35 men crowded in this place. This is where we believe Paul was. How you died in this place depended on what they wanted to do with you. Sometimes they would simply strangle you. They would wrap a cord around your nose and pull it until you couldn't breathe anymore and you were dead. It was cruel. When I was doing the research on this particular prison, there was another means of death that is absolutely disgusting. I almost hate to tell you, but you need to understand what Paul's mindset is and what he thinks he's about to face. So I told you it's a cistern, two stories below ground. It had a little opening in one lower side. And what happened was right outside this cistern, the city's water and sewer ran by. So underground, the, the sewage and the, the junk of the city would float by. That's what kept it very damp and very cold in there. What they would do was this. <clears throat> they would open the opening and into this cistern would flow sewage and water. And it would fill the cistern and the men would be drowning in sewage and water. And that's how a number of the prisoners died. It was, just, it was awful. It was terrible. The smell in that room must have been unbelievable bad. And here's Paul, perhaps the greatest evangelist, the greatest church planter of all time in this place. Paul, how did you not go insane? How did you not get angry with God and say, God, I have, I have served you passionately ever since I met your son on that road. How can you leave me in a place like this to die? It's not fair. It's not fair. In the Western world, in America these days, we're, everything has to be fair. In our government, in our institutions, and even sometimes in our churches, we try to correct all the things that are not fair. And the more we correct this problem, we find another area that's not. And we're all about fairness these days. Well, if anyone had a claim to saying, this isn't fair, it was the Apostle Paul. And what you're going to see in this letter is not an angry man. It's not a bitter man. It's not a man who is complaining to God and saying, you treated me terribly. I deserve it. We don't see that at all. We see an honest man. We see a lonely man. We see a man who has been hurt by people who have abandoned him and left him. But we don't see a bitter man. 
because he trusted Jesus Christ with his life, and he never looked back. This letter is going to read like a navigational map of things to avoid and things to embrace. Because Paul's passion is Jesus Christ. Paul's passion is the church of Jesus Christ. Paul's passion is the gospel. We've said time and time again, the gospel motivated everything that this man did. He used up his life in the sharing of the gospel message with anyone who he came in contact with. Let me leave you with two questions. The first question is this. Would you be willing to read this letter? Maybe you need, if you're watching this on video, just stop and read this letter from start to finish. It's only four chapters long. It's not very many verses. But to just get an understanding, and maybe that's our homework for today, is to pause after this recording and say, I'm just going to read it. Read it twice. If you have access to more than one translation, read it from a second translation or a paraphrase. But read it. Get Paul's emotion. Get his heart. You don't have to understand the details. Just get the, I, I say to our people, get the flavor. Get the taste of what he's saying. But the second thing I'd like to ask you is this. Look at your own life and ask yourself this question. What am I navigating toward? Or what am I navigating away from right now? Many of the students in my class right here are university students. So you encounter many students like yourselves. You're encountering a lot of situations. You're, you're dating or you're going to get married. You're going to have a, a family in the next number of years. You're going to have a career. What are you navigating toward and what are you navigating away from that reflects your identity in Jesus Christ? You might be a child watching or listening to this. You might be an older person. You might be a middle-aged person. Ask yourself the same question. If you'll ask yourself that question and begin to form some answers, when we come back and look at what Paul offers, you're going to say, that helps me. That encourages me. Some of you might say, that challenges me. I need to make some changes. When we come back, we'll begin to dive into the particular substance and depth of this letter. That's our introduction. When we come back, We'll get into the next part of chapter one. So let's take a short break. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150 or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.